now Marco, Marco Tortoriello, uh, expert in networking. I said, uh, as I mentioned, uh, thank you again, Andrea. Um, at the beginning, one of the key clear uh, elements, you also get music uh, as an introduction. This is fantastic. Um, is networking, is one of our important legs. I mean, uh, it's networking, it's continuous learning, it's career, and it's fundraising, but clearly networking is one of You are an expert of networking. We are very eager and interested to hear from you how to improve our networking skills. That's Thanks great. for That's coming. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, I, hope you can, uh, I hope you can hear me just fine. Um, I've always been fascinated with uh, network uh, and networking, and being an academic by training, I've been studying network and networking for the last 15 years. Uh, so when they invited me to speak at this event and I was checking the program and I saw uh, a networking breakfast, uh, networking coffee, networking lunch, networking this, networking that, I said to myself, this is a wonderful opportunity for me to tell people what I know about network and how we can improve on network. Uh, there are many different definitions of network in general. The way I like to think about network is the process through which people build meaningful relationships that allow them to access and offer uh, resources uh, to, um, to others. Uh, there are many different networks that we can explore and think about, and today what I want to focus on is your professional network what you can get through your professional network and how to go about networking uh, uh, professionally. Um, I must say though that there are a lot of misconceptions uh, related to the activity of networking. There are a lot of false beliefs uh, which are mostly due by the preponderance of bad networking habits, of bad networking practices. So simplifying somewhat, uh, I guess the whole conversation around professional networks uh, gets squeezed between two fairly negative uh, extremes, uh, which represent two fairly negative ways to go about networking. So uh, the, the, the first, the dominant approach uh, on the one hand to networking is the passive networker. This is the person that, that basically don't care about networking. I mean, it will come to event, uh, it will exchange ideas with you, will sit down for a coffee if you invite him, it will go home uh, and, 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 and then nothing happens. He will say, gee, what a waste of time. Uh, so it's not very useful. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on the opposite extreme, uh, you have another category of networker, which is the, the, the desperate networker, right? So this is, uh, this is a person that will come to a networking event with a bag full of uh, business cards and, you know, will start handing out those uh, uh, to, to increase his network. And God forbid, if this person corners you for a second, uh, it, it will start saying everything about his latest idea uh, and, and what is going on with his life and, uh, and, and stuff and so on and so forth. And it will come across as desperate. And truth of the matter is, most of the time, someone that engages in this kind of behavior is desperate to get something, to achieve something. Maybe it's money, maybe it's resources, maybe it's another contact with someone that could help him. Uh, 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 in any way, it's very off-putting as a behavior because what are the chances that you're gonna help someone like this person if the last time you heard from him was when he needed something else, right? Uh, uh, and so uh, what I'm gonna argue is that this, uh, these two things, these two extremes are actually doing a disservice to the idea of networking, disqualifying it a little bit. Because it's like saying either networking doesn't matter at all or only desperate people, people that are instrumental in the way they go about networking would resort to that. And in fact, there is some evidence uh, suggesting that people that engage in professional networking afterward, they feel uh, dirty, they feel guilty. It's called the Macbeth effect uh, from Shakespeare, Lady Macbeth, that was constantly seeing uh, imaginary blood stains on her hands out of guilt for committing murder. Um, it doesn't have to be that way though, and there is a third way to networking, which I would like to briefly share with you, uh, uh, and it's what I like to call smart networking. And smart networking starts with the realization uh, that networking is not just for, for uh, 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 accessing things, it's also for giving things. So uh, people value different things at different point in time, and there are things that you have that maybe you don't value them as much that can be extraordinarily valuable for someone else. So it would be a great way to approach someone by offering what you have 
to offer. So think broadly about what other people value is useful and build relationship based on substantive and shared interests. So try not to network in an overly instrumental way because that comes across as fake, that comes across as negative, that comes across as making you feel guilty. Uh, and, and first and foremost, every one of us should think about networking as an activity of learning and discovery. First and foremost, an activity of learning and discovery. And if we consider network as an activity like that, that reminds us something very important. That most of the value that comes through uh, network ties comes from new network ties, comes from diverse network ties, comes from people that we didn't know before. It's very seldom the case that the value of your network resides with your innermost circle of contacts. These are new people that you add to your network that bring value to it. And so the idea is we should meet new people. Meeting new people is important. Uh, but meeting new people is, is also hard for a variety of reasons. And I want to show you, uh, I want to share with you the result of a study that a colleague of mine at Columbia University performed a while ago when he was interested in understanding how people make new connections. And, uh, uh, and he mm, conceived of this natural experiment in a setting similar to, to a reunion, not quite, but kind of similar, where he had four classes of an executive MBA, about a couple of hundred people, uh, that were to get together in a mixer, in one of these events when you go and meet new people. And he asked these guys, what are your motives for joining this networking event? And 95% uh, of them said, the primary reason why I'm coming to this event is to meet new people. And so the organizer said, that's great, that's fantastic, that's exactly what we want this meeting to be about. And when they ended out the name tag, uh, uh, when the event was about to begin, uh, they also put a little GPS system uh, uh, at the bottom of each name tag. So that at any point in time, the researchers in the background could track the movement on the space of this meeting in terms of where people were going, next to whom they were going, and how long they were staying there, to then observe if whether or not they managed to make new connections, to meet new people. What do you think happened? And we didn't need an experiment for that, right? Most of the times, people spend time with people they already knew. Even though they said, I'm, going, I'm coming to this meeting to meet new people, right? And actually, I got in touch with this guy, and he sent me the, the, the video of this. I'm going to show it to you. It's a little geeky, and the quality is not great, so bear with me. Uh, but but this, this is how it looks. So people come to the event. Relationships are formed. New people come in. They see someone over there, and they say, hey, and they join at some point. Uh, lines are purple or gray. Purple lines are relationships that already existed. Thick lines are relationship of people spending a lot of time with each other, and thin lines are relationship of people spending very little time with each other. These are about the first 15 minutes of the party, okay? And what you see, I mean, I have the whole video, but you know, it's a, it's a little complicated to, uh, and boring perhaps to show. Uh, how many green, um, sorry, gray lines do you see? You know, very few. Vast majority of these lines are purple and strong. People spending time with people they already knew. And I show this to you for three reasons. So. If we can go home with the slide, all right. So there is a sort of a social physics when it comes to forming relationship. It's like a law of physics. It's like a social gravity that brings us close to those that we know already. Uh, uh, so existing ties become stronger and, and, and newer ties are never formed, uh, which is kind of a shame. There is a strong tendency also toward homophily because we like people like us. Uh, physically, by gender, by political uh, ideologies, by anything, by religion, right? So there is a strong tendency toward homophily. And there is a strong tendency toward forming clusters, toward forming groups of cohesive people that all look alike or kind of think alike along some uh, dimensions. And oh, by the way, the party study was just one case because it doesn't happen only at parties. This happens everywhere. So. The idea is the resulting effect from this is that if you have imagined to ideal typical network structure, the most dominant network structure that we have is a structure like this, which is ubiquitous, everywhere, 
uh, is almost always bad for your performance, for your innovativeness, for your activities, for everything. We are embedded in a strong network composed of multiple third-party types. This other network structure over there, on the other hand, when you're still at the center of the network, but you're reaching out, you're opening out to different communities, uh, is always good for you and your performance, but is very rare to find. So the message here should be that if we leave our professional network unmanaged, if we succumb to the social forces that, that bring us together, to people like us, we end up being connected with people that are physically located next to us, with people we tend to like interpersonally, with people that are similar to us in terms of knowledge, background, expertise, and skills, uh, with people we already know, uh, and oh, by the way, this is completely irrespective of their actual ability to help us getting things done, to give us fresh blood, to give us new ideas. So uh, this, this tendency to cultivate, this is kind of paradoxical because everyone knows that having a network that is diverse is good, but then it almost never happens this way. And uh, uh, most of the damage that comes from a network that is not diverse enough comes in terms of missed opportunities. I wanna try to convince you of that with a, with a little example. Um, so at some point a while ago, um, Time Warner, the media conglomerate, owned uh, American Online, the largest provider of uh, internet service to American households, uh, and Warner Music, the second largest uh, catalog in terms of musical rights. There were two divisions of Time Warner. And retrospectively, a few analysts a while ago from Wall Street, they said, how is that possible that Time Warner did not invent something like iTunes? I mean, they had the rights to sell songs. They had access to millions of people in the US. They couldn't do one plus one and start selling songs through the internet. And we had to wait for an hardware company, Apple, to create iTunes, multi-million dollar business, selling songs through the internet. So the reason for that uh, is primarily structural. Organizations are made of major groupings, business units, geography, products, market, functions, divisions, whatever you wanna call it. And the net result is that these structure tend to create, tend to shape the way in which people interact with each other within the boundaries of the organization, of that particular unit. So the natural silo translates in a loss of opportunity. Imagine the red circle here is uh, uh, American Online and the green one is uh, 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 Time Warner, they couldn't do one plus one because there was no connection. They were just not talking with one another. Instead, we should try to make an effort to form a network that span boundaries as much as we possibly can. Geographical boundaries, formal boundaries, social boundaries, because this is how it should be for you to um, really benefit from your uh, network. Um, I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm, almost, uh, I'm almost closing here. Uh, there, are, there are a few points I would like to bring to your attention. Uh, uh, networking smart is very important. So it's not just about wasting your time at a networking event. It's not about being cynical the way you go about networking. It's striking the right balance that allows you to connect with people in a way that makes sense. Building network takes a lot of time. We should be mindful of that. The metaphor here is that you should start digging the well before you get thirsty. Because otherwise, when you try to extract value from the network, the network is just not gonna be there for you. It's expensive to build and maintain network ties, and it's not about how big your network is. I mean, this is extraordinarily wrong. After a certain threshold, the size of your network doesn't matter anymore. If you go on the internet, there is this guy, he's an anthropologist from Oxford, that came up with a magic number, it's called the Dunbar uh, number, uh, which says that cognitively, there is a part of, uh, uh, of our brain that deals with social relationships. We cannot cognitively maintain active more than 150 connections at any given point in time. Uh, and so there is no point in trying to build a network that is greater than that. There is a lot of point though in trying to make sure that your network constantly evolves constantly reshape itself and reorganize itself around new connections. Um, and, and so the importance is on the diversity. And what I wanna say here is that the Bocconi Alumni Network is a fantastic platform to exercise your network. 
because you all have, we all have something in common, which is the fact that, you know, in one, sh one way, shape, or form in the past, uh, we passed through the Bocconi system. And then we move to Cincinnati, we move to different places, we move to different industries, uh, in different businesses, different things. There's an extraordinary amount of diversity and richness there that it would be good to uh, uh, leverage and, uh, and, and put to good use. And also, the last point uh, um, is actually really fun to network smart once you learn how to do it. Um, if I go back for a second to the uh, experiment that I told you at the party, the people that met more people were those who were drinking more and stayed at the party longer. So I very much look forward to have a glass with you uh, uh, tonight so that we can engage in proper networking. Thank you. We have some time, please. It's not working. No, it seems like uh, let's, let, okay, okay. Um, I believe more in rainforests because networking is really enjoyable. I enjoy doing networking, but it's really hard to find uh, people that have shared at least one common interest when you don't them before. So. Sometimes it's very uh, easy, easier to go to rainforest, so centers of shared interest. It's an amazing thing. I, I, I'm here since 2004, and I met a lot of people here that I met in Shanghai, that I met at the tech uh, rainforest, that I tech in uh, biotech rainforest, and then I see them again here mm -hmm. because, but I met them before we, we had common interest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's much harder to, to networking when you don't have, don't even know if you have shared interest right. before knowing each other. That's right, yeah. It's the, it's, the, it's the fear of silence, right? What do I say to this person now? I have no idea what to talk about, okay? Um, I guess, you know, there are, there are all sort of um, uh, resources to learn how you do that, you know, to learn the fine art of small talk. But it's not just about that, you know, sometimes uh, uh, you can go through a referral or sometimes you can see that there is one person that you know and that person can help you get, you know, or introduce you to someone else, you know, through referral. Uh, the important part here is to always be uh, super open and, and honest about things, right? I mean, every, you know, we, we need constantly help. You know, we cannot do it alone in this world, primarily, right? It takes two for us to put us in this world. Uh, and, and it gets worse from then on. Uh, so if you're open about that, chances are the other person is also going to be open uh, about that. Um, you might be unlucky and stumble upon the passive networker or the desperate one. That's okay, you know. I mean, there are also smart networkers around us. And once you met them, it's, uh, it's actually it's a joy. Anything else? Any? There is one over there. Hello. Uh, I really appreciate it when you say that uh, it's important to uh, boost the networking inside the company and what really I'm trying to do also. And one of the first points, as you said, is the sharing. But what is uh, your suggestion in order to improve the capabilities of the people in start to network, first maybe inside the company and maybe outside and also to search mm -hmm. other jobs, not a problem mm -hmm. in, uh, in the market. Right. So which are the suggestions in order to help the people in improve their capability in doing that mm -hmm. to uh, improve the capability to share and improve the capability also to speak with other mm -hmm. departments mm -hmm. or groups uh, also inside the single uh, location of the company and also outside if the company is a worldwide covering company. Mm -hmm. um, that's an important question. I think uh, what's very important particularly in an intra-organizational context is to prime people about the importance of observing and listening. We don't do that. We don't do that often enough. Right? I mean, if, if we just listen or maybe, you know, we pretend to listen, it's because we don't care, right? Instead, we should actively listen and actively observe. And then it will, will come almost naturally to jump into the conversation or to start building your network in a way that is going to help and support you uh, in that company or, or outside. Uh, there's one here and one in the back. Andrea, and then in the back there is one. 
Marco, are there any results about uh, the practical implications of networking on careers? I mean, yes. there, there must be tremendous self-selection problems in, in, in that, uh, and, and in some of so, And, and there is, yes, there is. excellent, excellent uh, point. So, I mean, of course, there is a lot of self-selection in the sense that someone who's good, chances are he's also good at networking. And so it's not the effect of networking on performance, it's the fact that this guy is good in the first place, right? Um, even accounted for that econometrically uh, or, or, or providing people training for network and then observing how their performance changes from you know, before and after, there is an overwhelming amount of evidence suggesting that returns to network professionally in terms of career prog progression or, 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 or salary increase uh, or likelihood that your idea will be accepted, that you will be put in charge of a project, so on and so forth, any positive things that you can say performance-wise controlling for how good you are in the first place tend to be disproportionately associated with the fact that you have an open and sparse network. It's disturbingly recurrent as a uh, finding. So yeah. That was another exactly. You get the mic. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you because I, I won't feel uh, frustrated anymore when uh, I'm capable of networking in a meeting like today. Uh, my, th my question is, do you think that millennials and generation Z after that will mm, professional network in the same way that we do? Because we always think of networking as a physical meeting. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about uh, professional networking uh, using social media, LinkedIn or whatever. Do you think that this will really change or it will still be, be linked to a physical contact? I mean, physical contact is still important, right? So through the, it's, it's true that the social media escalated our possibility to, to be in touch with someone, right? And so there are people that, you know, that is sort of this, this race in saying, you know, I got, I don't know, uh, 7,000 contacts on LinkedIn, I got a million likes on this post, I got this, I got that, right? You can reach to a lot of people. Um, you can reach to a lot of people means you can possibly tap into their ability to help you if you connect with the right ones. Now, together with ability to be in help, there is this other dimension, which is the willingness of someone helping you. The fact that this person is gonna engage in actually sharing his or her ability with you. And that, you know, you really need face to face there. You really need to invest in those ties. So, in other words, social media increase the scale, but, but then when it comes to the actual activation of the ties, we go back to or the visual contact or some kind of social contact. You know, we, we cannot, at least I don't think in, 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 the, in this generation or the next, we can, we can do away with it. Interesting. Any other curiosity question? All right. Okay, Marco, Good. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So